you know, so, you know, they're like, oh, but what would happen with this? It's like, look, it wants to do it well. And we're either, as you said, eating the wrong foods that are like not allowing it to get out of inflammation or we're moving in a way that's not allowing it to, you know, we're, we're stiffening up joints that are not allowing us to move the way we should. But once we, once we like switch on the right muscles and we start working them even slightly, the body will be like, oh yeah, okay, that's what I need to be doing correctly. And it will start, it will start improving. Welcome to the Radical Health Rebel podcast. I'm your host, Lee Brandon. This work started for me several decades ago when I started to see the impact I could make on people, helping them to identify the root cause of their health problems that no doctor could figure out, including serious back, knee, shoulder and neck injuries, acne and eczema issues, severe gut health problems, even helping couples get pregnant after several IVF treatments had failed. And it really moves me to be able to help people in this way. And that is why I do what I do and why we have this show. In this week's episode of the Radical Health Rebel podcast entitled Lower Back Pain and Movement Optimization, I sat down with Owen Everard, a chartered physiotherapist and a lecturer in sports medicine and strength and conditioning, who has a PhD in biomechanics and regularly works with people with lower back pain. Owen is also a very accomplished middle distance runner and is the current world indoor over 35s 3000 meter champion. When Owen approached me about coming on the show, I thought it would make for a really interesting dialogue between the two of us coming from different educational backgrounds, but both very experienced in helping people with lower back pain. And all I'll say is I wasn't disappointed. Owen Everard, welcome to the Radical Health Rebel podcast. Thanks for coming on the show. Lee, thanks so much for having me. Really appreciate being on. Yeah, it's really it's really great to have you on. I think I think I'm right in saying you're the first Irishman to come on the show. So uh so it's a nice nice honor for you to have. Yeah, that's uh that's a great little honor to have. <laughs> so Owen, to kick things off, uh could you share with the audience perhaps your history, including your own athletic background? how and why you became a physiotherapist and why your particular interest in back pain? Yeah, so basically um, I'm the current world and European over 35 3K champion. I've broken the four minute mile, um, five time national champion here in Ireland from like, represented Ireland from like 800 metres to 10,000 metres. So I was always good at running when I was younger and then you might have a couple of injuries so you'd go to a physio. Um, So just got interested in what they were doing there, but really didn't know the job. And then um, went to work placement and work experience in Canada during my training. And they were, this was like 2008, and they were like talking about this functional movement screen, like this idea that you could have an issue in one area that could cause another. And it's about looking at the whole chain. And you know, if something just clicks in you, like, oh, that is the way to do it. Um, so that, that then just lit a fire in me to really look at that element. And one area where that really occurs is the back. So a lot of times the body basically is designed in mobile and stable joints. So if you think about it, like your arch, like fallen arches, we, we should have like stable arches. They should be able to hold that position. Ankles should be mobile. They should, you know, you can, should be able to move your ankle in any direction. And generally, when we have any problems in the ankle, it's because they're stiff. The heels lift, say, when we're squatting. The knees are a hinge joint. They should only flex and extend. And again, the main problem we see with knees is they buckle in, they move too much. The hip is a ball and socket joint. It should have a really re- full range of motion. The lower back should be stable. The upper back, thoracic spine, where flex, that should be opened up. Shoulder blade stable, shoulder uh, shoulder joint mobile. So you see, as a physio, you see a lot of knee pain and back pain because the other joints, if they're stiff, they're not moving. So they're not going to get in like prob- uh, trouble short term. But the, the joints that are moving excessively, like the back and the, the knee, can you see a lot of issues because they're moving too much causing like kind of irritations so just having that kind of general concept of this isn't just at the back we need to address movement at the hip movement at the upper back um 
got me very interested in it. And the mechanics in the back are relatively simple, but a lot of physios don't really understand it. Or um, I don't know why, but like the stuff they do isn't great. Like I'd have so many people come in and they're like, I have, I have back pain for the last year. And I was given this like, you know, figure four glute stretch. And that's all they've been given. I had one woman recently, right? She was going in for her fourth surgery. And like, again, never been given like a glute bridge, never any core work, anything like that. So that got me very interested in it. Um, I wrote a book called The Secrets of a Healthy Spine. And, and then I developed this back aware belt, which essentially was when I was giving people the rehab exercises to do, they sometimes then would... Uh, come back doing them completely wrong. They wouldn't have a good awareness of where they should be. They'd be actually rounding their back. So the back aware belt was a project where it would give people feedback that they're doing things correctly. Um, and then that's been just the kind of thing I've been working on and developing like back Pilates programs ever since. So just to take you back a little bit. So you say you're in, you're in Canada. Yeah. Did you say you were studying in Canada? Yeah, I was, it was in part of my, so, you know, you do like a six month work placement. Right. And then, um, part of that, I was work, oh, go on, sorry. At what age were you then? I was about 20. Okay. And so you were officially studying in Ireland, is that right? Yeah. And what were you studying at that point? Uh, physiotherapy. Okay. Right. So you've been an athlete pretty much all your life. Yeah. Uh, till since about sixteen, my brother, um, he basically won. The, he he got he ran for Ireland. He kind of, I'm not saying he fluked it, but kind of fluked it. Um, and then he just kept rubbing it in my face. So then I was like, I gotta do this at least one time just to shut him up. And then I just got kind of hooked. Cool. And obviously, and obviously, you were very good. What? So was it? Was it predominantly? due to your kind of your your athletics that got you into physio yeah 100 percent. like you go to physio it's i always see it as well it's like you know it's it's a hard thing to know what to do when you're like 17 or 18 because a lot of times when people say to me um oh my 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 son or daughter is good at biology or stuff like that in school and they're like oh i think they'd like to do physio and it's like that has absolutely nothing to do with physio like you need to be how are you like you know dealing with people like you know working for yourself or these are more of the things that come in and it's it's a very hard thing to do because when the people talk about the subjects they do in school and then dictating that you know it's the same oh, i'm good at english i'll do journalism it's like okay well mainly for journalism are you are you okay with like more unstable income? Are you okay with like putting yourself out there to try get like little freelance contracts? Are you okay with traveling things? These are more the things that are important as opposed to like, I like English. Yeah. So as an athlete, you were receiving physiotherapy. Yeah. Was there, was there like one physiotherapist that kind of really inspired you? Uh, no, not really. Like I actually went around to a lot of them and I just, I just liked the, you know, I suppose when you're in there, you're chatting to people, you're like, and you're like, oh, look, I'm active. It's like that or PE teaching, you know, it's that, it's that kind of thing. It's like, well, I'm fit and I like sports. So it has to it'll be one of these things, but I didn't really enjoy going around and I still do um, try to go to as many different physios or different type of therapists that I can. Cause even when I go to like a, a hotel, you know, if you see something like blatantly wrong in the hotel and you're like, do they never go to a hotel? Have they never been somewhere and realized, oh my God, this is so much better than the way we do it. So I think it's, it's good to go around and getting different, having been an athlete, getting different like treatments and seeing what they did. It kind of just fascinated me and I kind of went from there. Okay. So, so you're an athlete, you, you are receiving physiotherapy and you kind of thought, "Hmm, this is interesting. Maybe I'll, take that up at university yeah yeah that's exactly it okay so one of the things i know that you you suggest is that the you know the first hour <clears throat> is the most important with back pain so what what should people do in that 
first hour? Yeah, so the first hour is really important, especially if people have disc pain. Okay, so if people have disc pain, what happens is overnight, discs take on fluid because you're lying down on your um, lying down flat. There's not that pressure from above. Okay, so overnight, the discs take on fluid and then essentially they expand a little bit. Okay, so if you can imagine like a water bottle, if you have that water bottle completely full, if I squeeze on the sides any little bit, it's going to kind of shoot water out the top. And especially if you have disc bulges, that can occur as well. Because there's increased water, when you increase the volume, you increase the pressure. So because there's increased volume from lying down all night, there's increased pressure in the disc. So now kind of any poor movement, like say, if you now go to like bend and lift something heavy or you sit in a poor position for for a while, um, because the pressure in the disc is higher than it normally would be, the chance of bulging that disc or putting it out is worse. And a lot of your, a lot of people with back pain will know that they're more stiff and sore in the morning. Like they'll say, look, I struggle to put on my my shoes or my socks or I struggle to move. And that's because of that increased pressure. So there's two things that you want to do. The first one is simple. I always have like um, porridge, as we call it, or like, you know, oats for um, our American listeners. But if I put that in the microwave, I open up the kitchen door and I just power walk, swinging my arms at like, like, like power walking you see on on the roads, you know, so swinging your arms, there's basically a cross chain from your right arm across to your left glute and from your left arm, left arm or right arm across from to your left glute that makes an X and kind of supports the back. You're also walking, which is going to reduce the fluid in the disc. The second thing you want to do is, um, if you can lie on your back and essentially lift the front, the arch bit up. So you go into essentially a bit of a cobra. Now you don't want to force it in there, but like just doing that, like say 10 times. And what you're doing, if you think of a disc is like a jam donut. If I press down one side, when we're sitting, that's generally what happens. And it kind of is pushing the rest of the jam back to the other direction. If we do the extensions, we're literally doing the exact opposite motion of say sitting or flexing, which essentially pushes it back into the center. So if we do that 10 times, we power walk for the one, one and a half or two minutes. Um, that then allows us to, um, that then allows us to reduce the fluid in the disc in the first, say, five minutes in the morning, enough that then we can get on with the day. Now, if we move, just like if I, if I drank some water, I can press on the water, I can press on the bottle now without it spilling out the top because that, there's that reduced fluid, uh, reduced pressure, if that makes sense. Yeah, so so what you're suggesting is for, for most people, that would be a good thing to do first thing in the morning because, you know, as we know, you know, disc, disc bulges are probably the most common type yeah. of injury yeah. in, the, in the lumbar spine. So a... a to avoid that in the first place, that would be a good way to start the day. Yes. But also anyone that also has a known disc injury as well, that would also be potentially a good thing to do to start the day. Yeah, a, a lot of people mightn't even know that they have a disc injury per se. They might just know that they have like stiffness in their back or they might have like sciatica, like, you know, like into their bum. And again, especially if it's worse in the morning than the evening, the most the most likely thing is it's a disc issue. It's a it's a disc irritation. Now people can get really scared about that because there's a lot of like fear about that. But honestly, discs are like one of the easiest things to fix. Once it's not going below your knee, all you need to do, you need to imagine that, like you said there, Lee, like if you had a small cut, we just don't want to irritate that cut. So, um, so there's two things. One, if people could do that in the morning, every day, like power walk, ideal, especially just for a good spine hygiene. Like a lot of us are sitting, a lot of us are doing things in these flex positions. It would probably like, um, it would probably, you know, really help. If you are someone who is stiff in the morning or has like disc bulges, then that's like essential. And then if it does calm down and you kind of get out of the habit, it's a thing of like, say for myself, like I do my Pilates once a week. Um, just to keep everything like the core and everything moving the way it should. But every so often, you know, I saw 
I saw two people in where my hometown having a fight um, literally last week when I was driving and I like, it was just a sort of random thing to see. I like really like, like rotated my spine and I kind of like jarred my, jarred my back. So I then had like this, it was like a disc irritate, like it gets irritated every now and again. Then those next say, you know, like if I, if I imagine I kind of cut it open, I just need to be careful. So that's when I'm going to power walk. I'm going to do my extensions. I'm going to just be careful when I'm sitting. I'm going to be like to the edge of a edge of a chair. I'm not like going to sit fully into the chair. And if I am sitting fully into chair, I'm having like a rolled up towel or something in the small of my back to keep it in that slightly arched position ra- rather than that slightly rounded flex position. So uh, sorry, I can go go on with these things, but I think it's one, if you if you do get stiff or sore in the morning, if it's hard to put on your shoes or your socks, these doing these things is essential. If it is good spine hygiene, but if if you don't have any of these problems, I would do it. But a lot of people won't. They just won't find the time for those. If I was going to find time, I think like doing like a kind of back Pilates program once a week to just restore your body would be a better use of time and third is if you do used to have this stiffness and soreness you got rid of it and something happens that you irritate your back a little bit you just have a kind of management system you're like okay it that's been irritated for the next two weeks three weeks i gotta just go back doing my morning routine go back doing my power walking and being careful and allowing that to heal and that can you see a lot of times it's the not knowing what to do kind of catches a lot of people out and they're not they they don't want that diagnosis or they think it's a catastrophe if it's a bulging disc and a bulging disc is nothing to be worried about it just needs to have specific things to do like you know take care of it in the morning yeah gotcha so one of, one of the things that so obviously you're being quite specific you know if it's people if they're, they're they're stiffer in the morning but it actually eases a little bit as the day goes on yeah that's a yeah. that's a classic sign of, of a disc injury what if someone gets up in the morning they do their little power walk they do their cobra movements but that actually increases pain what what would you what would your advice be for those people yeah the advice then would be the thing which is very simple with the back is let let pain be the guide Okay, so if you have it that like you do the cobra movements or like in the morning, because the other thing with discs, sorry, is that you'll get it. It could be okay in the morning, but when you sit for a long time, either getting up out of the seat can be sore because you was in a flex position and then you come back up, you're kind of compressing it back down and that can be very sore. Um, again, you just want to watch your your seating habits, which we can talk about. Um, you, So that's the other thing with the disc. But the other part we can have is where it's it's okay in the morning and as the day goes on it gets sore or it's sore when we walk for a long time so the great thing about the back which i just don't understand why it's like really simple like it's it's way more simple than people think but yet the rehabs are like terrible or so if it's if it's sore doing extensions don't do extensions and if because there's like joints in the back okay so called facet joints and what most likely is occurring there then without any like sciatica or without any like real stiffness in the morning is that the joints themselves are a little bit irritated so we nearly want to do the opposite then so say if we do um our cat camel arching and rounding the back and then we get up and we do it and then basically all we're always trying to think is what are the things that cause irritation or pain limit or manage those so say if it's like walking around then for that person generally you're going to find not power walking i would still recommend power walking because it's just it basically gets the muscles to support the back but i would have it where if i walk around shopping like just with my wife after a while my back can get like very achy so what you want to do with that person is try sit or if there's like uh a railing or whatever place your hands on the railing and just let your back drop so we're essentially like letting the knees drop like and taking all the pressure through the hands and what that'll do is it'll just like gap open the back a little bit and give a little bit of relief um yeah so the thing with back pain compared to like tendons which can be a little bit harder is 
when when like just do what causes what do what relieves it and what gives you relief and then do and stop doing the things that cause pain because one of the biggest myths and i don't know we were going to say this but i believe is like this term like non-specific low back pain back pain 90 like 95 plus percent of the time has a specific reason it's just trying to locate locate that reason you know like where you you know it, it just to get it like a bit more specific so if it causes pain don't do it and then if it relieves pain, try to do more of it. And you'd be surprised how quickly you can start managing that issue. Yeah, that, that concept of non-specific lower back pain to me is is a little bit lazy. It's like it's lazy. I don't I don't I don't know how to find out what the cause of the problem is. So therefore I won't try and I'll just call it non-specific lower back pain. Yeah, that's what I find as well. I think that's that's exactly right. Like it's easy to nearly blame the patient. It's in your head. And it's a nearly an ego thing that like, this is just in your head. This is something that uh, there's no reason for. But, um, you know, and how often, like, I've had it loads of times, even with um, other conditions, where like, say it's like, oh, I was told this was in my head or I told this was, um, you know, yeah, just something I have to live with. It's more like like a pain management thing. And then, yeah, they find the issue. Like they, they, some some other test shows them it that wasn't there and then it, the issue's gone. I'm like, that's so funny. Like if they hadn't found that, they would just be forever convincing you that that was just in your head or that was just like not an issue. Like, you know, a guy, he had a knee problem after surgery and... um they kept taking MRIs, right? And he's like, it just feels like there's something wrong in the knee. I'm like, no, no, look, this is just something. Now he came to me and I was like, look, I don't know. Like, I couldn't fix the issue, you know? I was like, yeah, look, you're getting strong. I don't know why. He's like, it just feels, and he actually said it, it feels like one of the screws is in. But they kept doing the MRI or they did a CT scan and saw it. No, it's fine. They went, he's like, just look, and I wouldn't recommend this for everybody because this is extreme. But he went back in, he's like, I think, can you look? They opened it up. One of the screws had actually just been driven too far through and was irritating it. Unscrew the thing and it's like, the guy's better. Now, I know that's an extreme case, but there's an example of like, oh, this is just in your head. And then, as you said, it's just a, sometimes it's a lazy thing of like, I don't know what's going on here. Sometimes there can be damage that can just need to be managed as opposed to be completely eradicated. But that doesn't mean that it's not related to something. Yeah, absolutely. I just want to go back. It might have been a slight throwaway comment you mentioned earlier, but you mentioned oats and you mentioned the microwave. And I just want to address those two things because one thing that's quite interesting that I I discovered in myself, and again, I think I've probably mentioned this on the podcast before, but I, where I, I, where I live now, I've moved here about four years ago. And for for some reason, whatever reason, I I decided to change my normal breakfast, and I and I started going back to eating oats and a protein shake for breakfast, which is something that I used to do back in the nineties. And shortly afterwards, I started getting pain in in my right knee. Yes. Uh, sorry, my left knee. Sorry, my left knee. And I've always called my left knee my good knee because I had an ACL injury. 20 years ago, my right knee. And um, I didn't put two and two together. I kept thinking, oh, it's, it felt like it was meniscus or, or medial collateral ligament. And it wasn't until I was teaching with a colleague and I said, oh, could you just do some tests on my knee just to confirm? And I was pretty confident it was probably the meniscus. And I like, did the meniscus test? No, nothing. And, you know, did the full, full range of assessments on my knee. And he said, it's osteoarthritis. And I was like, oh, okay, that's interesting. And I could get about 90 degrees of knee flexion in my, le- in my left knee. And, you know, I could get a full 135 degrees in my right knee, no problem. And for some reason, again, I don't exactly remember why, but I thought, Do you know, what? I'm just going to stop eating porridge for a while. Three weeks later, I had no pain in the knee and full range of motion. That's amazing. That's uh, incredible, isn't it? That, and I think that comes back to our kind of non-specific low back pain. That like, 
if you're not looking for something, like, so say we there, that you'd have non-specific knee pain. It's like, look, the knee is fine. It must be just a bit of wear and tear. But it's actually like, as you said, an inflammation problem caused by like, like oats or whatever, like irritating your gut. Yeah, that's really good, isn't it? And it's just, it's just why it's important. Look, you don't want people, you know, sometimes, and then you're just relying on painkillers. I was going to say, look, you're giving, are you giving hope to people? But that's, it is important just to stay looking for different things. If anything, you're just going to get at least healthier and fitter, you know, with a better diet. But yeah. And, that, and that's why, you know, a holistic approach is, is always the way to go, really, rather than, oh, you've got back pain. Let's just look at your back. 100%. And, and the fact that you mentioned a microwave, again, it might have been just a throwaway comment. What, what's your views on microwave ovens? Do you know what? I only I use them for my porridge in the morning, but I really shouldn't. I'm just lazy. Because <laughs> um, I did see one really good. It was like, wasn't a proper study. It was like, I think this little girl did it um, where they took water microwaved it and mortar and boiled it and then put it into two different plants and the difference between the plants after like two months is ridiculous yeah i've seen i've seen that yeah i see i mean i have done a, a fair bit of study into microwaves and because it for want of a better phrase denatures the food it, it because it vibrates the the cells if you like yeah like food yeah. and it causes it to explode from the inside out when when we eat those foods, our our body doesn't recognize it as food, so it actually creates inflammation because our immune system attacks it. So that that reason alone is probably a good reason not to. But the the other thing as well, it actually it actually is carcinogenic as well when you eat foods. Really? Yeah, yeah. I must actually get out because I don't do it for my dinners or anything like that. You know, if I had to heat it up, I put it in an oven. The idea being there is like, oh, well, at least these are like you know vegetables or whatever, a meat. Um, whereas like with oats, it's like, they're not that nutritious anyway. It's just more calories, but, um, yeah, I must actually get back to doing the pot. Yeah. I've got, I've got some good, good, uh, research on that. I'll, I'll send it to you. Yeah, please. 42 year old Chris came to see me whilst training for his first marathon. Initially, Chris wanted manual therapy on his calf muscles, which were taking a pounding from his long runs. I did recommend to Chris several times that he really needed a full exercise, nutrition and lifestyle program so he could complete the marathon in the quickest time and to minimize his likelihood of injury. However, six weeks from his first race, Chris suffered a debilitating back injury that meant he was unable to walk and was devastated that all his hard work had gone down the drain. Chris hobbled into my treatment room the next day to see if we could salvage the situation. I suggested to Chris that he do what I recommended all along, and if he did, he'd probably have a 50% chance of completing the marathon. So I've gave Chris a full physical assessment and then devised a comprehensive exercise, nutrition, and lifestyle program. And full credit to Chris, he gave it 100%, totally dedicating himself to the program. Days before the race, Chris came to see me for a final tune-up and to ask whether I thought he was ready for the race. I suggested he start the race, but to stop if he felt any back pain as there will always be other races. I received a text message from Chris the afternoon of the race to say that he completed it in three hours, 42 minutes, and he had no pain and had little to no muscle soreness. Chris has since gone on to run multiple marathons in impressive times. So if you're suffering from back pain that's preventing you from doing something that you love, why not arrange a consultation with me at www.bodycheck.co.uk so I can show you what's causing the problem and how you can get back to performing at your best. Now, back to the podcast. So moving on, what, what would you say are the key things to do if someone has pins and needles down their leg? Yeah. Some, some, yeah. Something that I've experienced myself. Was it above your knee or below your knee? Down to my big toe. Uh, okay. There's two, there, there's two reasons that you're going to guess like pins and needles the first is that uh the first is a disc if if it is a disc irritation generally what they're saying is it should be as long as it's above the knee you want to look at your conservative management so that's like doing your cobra stretches power walking doing your kind of pilates getting yourself moving better like stop irritating the disc now i have fixed people who've had disc irritations that are like like very 
big bulges that go down all the way. Because if you can imagine, um, if you can imagine what's happening there is that like as if there's a disc bulge, right? So the nerve, what's happened with pins and needles is if you can imagine like a bell, the nerve is getting kind of rang. And then it's like those two cups that you would have, you know, as children where like you can talk along the wire. So the louder one is hit at the point, the further down the wire it's going to go. So generally we're not worried and we just have to start our our interventions if it's above the knee because it's getting hit and it's either going into the bum or it's going into the bum and down the hamstring or down the quad. But if it's getting hit so much that it's going all the way down, say, to the big toe, the other thing we look at then is uh, to think of it's like a disc irritation on the nerve is, is there any like foot drop? So like when they lift up, do, is the, do they feel like they move the same? Or sometimes they might have like, if their foot is slapping off the ground, generally when it goes below the knee, you want to get that checked out further because that could be like a very big irritation and that might need surgery um, if you're just looking pure mechanically. Yeah, so um, so 10 years ago, I basically ruptured my L4-5, L5-S1. Okay, yeah. Which was... uh. An experience, shall we say? How do it? Learning experience. Yeah, how was the recovery since then? It took it took twenty two months. Yes, to recover. Yes. But um, yeah, no no painkillers, no anti inflammatories, no surgery. Brilliant. Just just um, you know, corrective exercise, yeah. nutrition, yeah. good sleep, good hydration. In, initially, I had to carry um, a lumbar roll everywhere I went. Yes. Well, that was that was after about a month because I couldn't sit at all for a month. All I could do was stand and lie down. That was that. Yeah. But, but yeah, an, an interesting and very educational experience. And that's a good indicate, like, even for that, for people, like, I think there's two things that you got to remember when it's like a disc irritation or something like that. You did a complete right thing there, Lee. It's like sitting is the one that causes pressure. So, a lot of times people can have pain like Monday morning and it could be, well, we were just sitting on your couch slouch. So I would say, look, you've got to tell your, your other half, you need to lie down on the couch if you're watching TV. You need to, what we call, spare the spine. Like, so like the way Lee's saying, bring in a lumbar roll. So he's staying in that correct alignment of a slight lordosis and not letting himself go into a flexion is important because we don't want to, especially if it's that much of a rupture, we just can't be irritating that area or it'll never heal. Like he just had a, a very big cut, but as long as he doesn't continue to irritate that, it will heal over the body heals. And especially then with, you know, Lee's background in making sure that he's eating the right foods and, you know, sleeping correctly, that's going to make such a, such a big difference. Um, the other reason then, if it's not that, that people can have like pins and needles essentially is um, that the piriformis. So it's like that sciatica is from, there's a muscle that goes underneath, it's underneath the bum. Uh, piriformis and just goes across from the hip kind of to the pelvis now the sciatic can I run through the sciatic nerve can run through that so again always like pins and needles is just some nerve is getting irritated it's getting hit and it's getting sent down so if that is getting pressed on um if that's getting pressed on it can cause that like sciatic pain that's that's the other main reason um generally it wouldn't be worse in the morning um wouldn't have that stiffness or soreness it can be sore if you're sitting on it a lot uh what we do there is like just a tennis ball initially but then like a hockey ball or a lacrosse ball into the middle of the bum you'll find it it'll be like if that's the area there'll be a real ropey muscle kind of underneath like as you sit into your bum and sink down turn your foot outwards you'll see this like ropey line um holding on that it might start twitching, which is a great sign. It might start sending the pain down like you get, which is also a good sign and would be a good indication that your sciatica or your pins and needles is caused by uh, that piriformis syndrome. Release that off. Then the other thing you need to really do there is work on like glute bridging, like getting the glutes working. So lying on your back, having your knees bent up, lifting them up. I would always really encourage that if you don't have a back of belt that I'm working on, like hand on your stomach, hand on your back. Make sure that 
if you're coming down and up, you're practicing that all the movement is coming through the hip joint, as opposed to like a lot of people do bridging and they're like arching through their back more or they're rounding through their back more. So we just need to practice not having the movement through the back and through the glutes and really get them burning. Why that is important is like you'll always need to have some stability. Your body won't let you just collapse to the floor. So if if you get this stability through um if if the glute muscles, the bigger muscles aren't aren't strong or because we're sitting a lot, we're not activating them, are not strong, some other muscle will take its place. And the one around there is the smaller piriformis underneath. So that's like trying to do a job it's inefficient for. It's like asking a sprinter um, to do like a long distance run or a long distance runner to do a sprint job. It'll kind of do it, but it's not going to do it efficiently and there can be issues. So we need to get the glutes working way more. That's when when people come in, say they have tightness in their bum or like back pain on one side with that SI joint. They're like, I'm doing this SI joint or I'm doing this like glute stretch. And I'm like, you need to get those. You sit on your ass 10 hours a day. You need to get those glutes burning. You need to get them woken up. They don't need a 30 second stretch. They need like to be burning, burning. So then they will allow the uh, piriformis to relax off because it doesn't have to do that job. Plus then when you like do your, you know, your hockey ball work or your, your foam rolling around that area, um, it can take that further pressure off, which then allows you to like relax and, you know, improve. Yeah. The other, the other thing I find with piriformis syndrome sometimes is that because obviously the piriformis crosses the sacroiliac joint, Yes. It's overworking because some of the other muscles that create stability across the sacroiliac joint aren't actually doing their job. Not not just the, the gluteus maximus. Yeah, 100%. 100%. Also, also, also like the abdominal wall. Yes. Um, yes. So obviously the, the glute works with the opposite latissimus dorsi to stabilize the sacroiliac joint, but the particularly the transversus obviously creates what we call a nutcracker effect around the SI joint. So what, what I what I sometimes see is that people have inhibition of their, in particular, their type 1 fibers of the transverse abdominis. And that, the piriformis then takes over the role, or or if you like, overworks yes. To, yes. to stabilize the joint. So then the next question I have in my mind is, why why is the transversus being inhibited? And very often, very commonly these days, again, it comes back to my, my uh, story with oats, it can be that someone's eating something that their immune system is responding to and it's creating inflammation. And then the inflammation is causing the inhibition of the type 1 muscle fibers. So I always try and look at that to see if that's a potential cause as well. So do you know what, Lee? And that's so, that's so good and it's so interesting. And it's something like, as I said, I'm coming from my PhD is in the mechanical, the biomechanics side which can be sometimes be a little bit like neglected. Or as you said, if we're talking about the non-specific low back pain, it's just like, look, you have it, accept it. But also then as well, if I just not thinking of the nutrition, it's definitely something I'm going to have to consider more with my treatments. Because as you said, if you have like inflammation of the gut, that is exactly it, that the piriformis is not working because the whole SI and pelvis isn't stabilized. Um, Glutes being one, core being the other. But again, we'll kind of, pushing a a car up a hill you know without the engine turned on if we're not like also addressing okay you could actually have this like chronic inflammation that is just inhibiting this muscle yeah very good i mean sometimes you you know it you know it's that because if someone works on the piriformis you know maybe even get some manual therapy on it stretches it and all of a sudden they start getting worse pain or it might even be a different type of pain. So it might be, you know, instead of it being pins and needles in the kind of glute area, they actually start getting pain right where the sacroiliac joint is. It's because the sacroiliac joint is actually becoming more unstable because the pyramid yeah. is working yeah. so hard to try and stabilize it. Now you've released it off and now the sacroiliac joint is is more unstable. Yeah, exactly. It can take time. One thing though, especially if it's disc pain, that sometimes... The pain might get worse in your back, but what you're looking for is 
a centralization of the pins and needles. So, sorry, that's just something. If you're doing a Cobra and you're like, oh, I started that, but the back, my back was sore, don't judge it off the back. Judge it off if the pins and needles, say, was at the back of your knee, but now is like only at the top of the hamstring, just in the glute, that's working. Like, get it to where the the pain is just in your back, but there's no pins and needles. You're way closer to fixing it than before. But that's a hundred percent true about like if you release if you release off that muscle, if it moves it and takes that pain away, um, then you know you're on the right lines in terms of look. We need to just get the other muscle stabilizing, and it's why it's so important, um, and why this is such a good talk. You know, again, I must um get you on just for for this because as I said we can have our own like viewpoints like as I said my PhD is in like the mechanics like like looking at like how the back is actually moving but that's such a good point that like it is the core it is the glutes it is the muscle like the smaller muscles in that we need to stabilize the pelvis and it's that lack of stability that we have to attract somewhere else but again as I, I mentioned I'm going up a just trying to push a car rather than drive it if I'm not then considering like listen you could be chronically inflamed with some of the foods you're eating and if you took that away all of a sudden like one thing I always tell the people like if they're a bit worried about this is that the body wants to be healthy it's a lot of times we put up the roadblocks you know so you know they're like oh but what would happen with this it's like look it wants to do it well and we're either as you said eating the wrong foods that are like not allowing it to get out of inflammation or we're moving in a way that's not allowing it to, you know, we're, we're stiffening up joints that are not allowing us to move the way we should. But once we, once we like switch on the right muscles and we start working them even slightly, the body will be like, oh yeah, okay, that's what I need to be doing correctly. And it will start, it will start improving. So we've spoke about if someone has pins and needles in one leg, yeah. what would you say if someone has pins and needles in both legs pins and needles in both legs it's actually quite strange you'd be looking at like again you're kind of looking at both uh things that that would be strange um you're either looking at like both two tight piriformises so what we're talking about there that like the piriformis is tight on both sides or you're talking about like um bilateral if you can if you can think about the disc as like a jam donut so it's got like the jam in the middle it's got the donut all the way around generally what happens if that gets pinched at one side the jam goes to the back but then it gets it'll it'll get either it'll kind of move to either like a right or the left if that makes sense because you know it's 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 wearing down the kind of outside dough bit and kind of peeking through there and like hitting the nerve so it usually hits the right nerve or the left nerve if you were getting on both sides what's kind of happened most likely is that it's irritated both sides and it's essentially like it's like there's a double bulge out of the disc um yeah it's called it's called a centralized bulge it's it's less common but you do see it so again i think i would do the same thing if it was stiff and sore in the morning if i was getting this worse I would just start doing my power walking. I would then do my like extensions. Does that then, when I put on my shoes or my, sorry, my socks, does that feel a little bit easier? If it does, I got to be super careful with like how I'm sitting. I got to be, you know, lying down rather than sitting down watching things on the couch. I got to be taking little micro breaks, you know, like power walking, maybe five minutes in my lunchtime or even a minute in my lunchtime. It's like, you know, just doing a little bit to try spare the back and then getting into my rehab and as you said, like working, um, working the the core muscles, doing like the Pilates that we do. And then, as I said, I'm going to add that. Whereas, like, just having a look at the your diet is there anything that you've you started to do? Because anything that can help you get into a healthy state is going to help. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's something that I've not seen clinically. Someone having uh, pins and needles in both legs. No, it's very very rare. Yeah, I mean. There, there are a couple of conditions that I know about that can cause that. Obviously, you know, a very serious disc bulge can cause that. But as I say, it's very rare. You normally get a posterior lateral disc bulge to one side. Well, obviously, a quarter equina is, is one condition where you can have it on both sides, which, you know, if someone wakes up in the morning and they've got pins and needles, lower back pain, 
and you know saddle anesthesia so if their perineum area is, yeah you know numb then you know, the normal recommendation is actually to ring 999 or 911 yeah. and yeah. Uh, seek immediate yeah. immediate medical advice i think that's important to send those as you said if we're at that like other red flags there are like if you have any bladder or bowel control problems so like if you can't stop yourself going for like you kind of for a pee uh you know there's a little bit of leakage there if you have like um like night pain or if you have any like unexplained unexplained weight loss in the last like six months like catequina syndrome as lee rightly says there it's like if you've got that kind of widespread like numbness right into the um the saddle region like like bowel or bladder control issues that kind of come on with the back pain unexplained weight loss or like night pain or again pain that has no like sometimes people say it's oh it's there all the time but if they actually thought about it it's like worse in particular things if i do this it gets worse if i do that but if it's actually a thing that just doesn't change at all get that checked out yeah and that that condition is is, is you know it's a medical emergency you need it's not something you want to wait on it's no you need no. to you need to do it immediately the the other condition that again I've not seen very much at all, and I've certainly not seen it with bilateral pins and needles or numbness in the legs, but a, a spinal stenosis that would be the other the other potential cause of a yeah a that would actually yeah pins and needles, um, which would obviously it would almost be the opposite approach to a disc. So rather than encouraging extension of the spine, you'd probably yeah. Want to ex- yeah probably want to encourage flexion of the of the lumbar spine. Yeah, that's exactly it. Like, so stenosis just for those, it's like just that there's a little bit of like wear and tear on the joint. So as the as the nerve is coming out on both sides, it's just kind of irritating both sides. Yeah, that's exactly it. And then that's where we're seeing where back pain can be simple in terms of we just, the things that cause irritation or pain do less of those. The things that give you relief do more of those. And then as I said, maybe look at the diet, see if there's anything that you do. Does that take pressure off or does that stop some inflammation? And then make sure that you're doing at least a kind of a kind of back Pilates or a, a kind of core and like pelvic kind of stre- like strengthening or stability work at least once a week to try to get that moving. Yeah. Yeah. So gonna gonna change subjects a little bit. And this is a this can be quite a contentious subject in our in our field. But what are your views on maintaining a neutral spine whilst exercising let's well, open up this can of worms yeah um i'm a fan of it just to say um so this is as lee was saying this is like a very contentious issue so i've come up with the back aware belt so it gives you feedback so that you can kind of maintain your your position so Generally with the neutral spine, I'm looking at like fully arching your back, fully rounding. And the idea that being somewhere in the middle is the safest position. I think for the majority of people, um, that is the best way to lift. Like that's the best way to lift. It, it keeps, you're not in your extremes. If you think of like a finger, if I like went all the way back or all the way flexed and then try to do something the 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 range for um the range for error is way less if you go to the if i if you took your shoulder and pulled it all the way back the range for like error or pain is way less if you're in the middle say in your back or say in any joint you can move a little bit left and right and to stabilize that is not to say that if someone isn't in a neutral spine examples are like say you know power lifters are lifting those boulders they're rounded but generally what they do is their musculature is so strong that they lock into that position so what you don't want to do is what a lot of people do say squatting they start and they're in this like arch position because the core isn't so they're going into an anterior pelvic tilt because the core isn't able to fire so they're getting their stability from their back muscles their hip flexors but as they go down, because the hip has to actually move, they can't hold the stability there. So then they go from that to the other extreme where they kind of go into that butt wink and they round. 
that is dangerous. It's just like that's like biomechanically, that's the movement through a range under load is is a thing that can cause issue. It's not to say that it's not to say that there isn't cases where if people have strong musculature, they can kind of really go into any position. If the muscles are strong enough, you can move. It's not to say that you're not allowed, you shouldn't be having a range when you're flex, like you shouldn't have flexibility in your back to move or that a back doesn't adapt over time. But for the majority of people, there's, there's, that's why I have the back wear belt. It's it's not like they're choosing to round, but doing it in a safe position. It's like they have no awareness or control of their back when they move. And I've seen way more people, I lifted this poorly or I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't aware of this position and then this caused a bulge. Then I do, like I actually chose to go into a more of a posterior pelvic tilt or I chose to round, but I really held it in a good position like a Jefferson curl. Yeah. What do you think about it? That was my rant I, on it. I'm kind of generally in agreement with what you said. So I, I look at it, you know, it's, um, it depends, it depends on what you're doing. So let's say, for instance, you've got someone, they've got back pain. Now I, I know from my own experience, one of the thing that pain does, it switches off your proprioception. So what I mean by that is it doesn't, your, your brain can't connect with where your body is in space or time, particularly in the area that's in pain. So I remember when I when I had my disc injuries, the area was numb. I mean, it was painful and it was numb. So if someone said to me, right, arch your back, flatten your back, arch your back, flatten your back, my brain was saying, I don't know how to do that because I can't feel the area. That was that's that's the first thing. So if you look at it from kind of rehabilitation or even a base conditioning type environment, you, you certainly want to work in a, in a neutral spine position. So for me, when I, when I started my, my rehab, which was literally days after I had the injury, um, a colleague of mine actually has uh, a device called a neutralizer, which is basically a stick that runs along your spine. It has a, a plastic screw that you can adjust. So you can put the end of the screw, which is sharp, at the level of L3, so you're actually maintaining neutral spine. And there's a string that goes around your waist to encourage you to activate your transverse abdominis at the same time. So what it allowed me to do, what it allowed me to do was Brilliant, yeah. to have the confidence that I could exercise with a neutral spine because because the screw was there, I could feel the screw. So if I was starting to flatten my spine, I would get a signal to tell me to stop flattening my spine. Because obviously, if you've got a damaged disc, you don't want to be flexing the spine because that can potentially create more, more damage to the disc. So the other thing that's really important is that the, the abdominal wall, particularly the transverse abdominis, is more easily activated from a neutral spine position. So we know that from, you know, the studies from uh, Richard and Giles Hodges and Hyads and Diane Lee. They've all they've all suggested that, you know, from their studies that when you've got neutral spine, you're able to activate the transverse abdominis much easier than if you're in a position that's not neutral spine. So that's one that's one aspect. The next aspect aspect I would say is that from a let's call it a functional training point of view. So I'm a tennis player. I can't play tennis with neutral spine, right? That's that's not possible. I, I have to rotate for starters, right? So there comes a point when you come out of what we might call base conditioning and you have to go into functional training. When you, you know, when you've, when you've done the base conditioning training adequately, you're then in a position to start strengthening the body and you're starting to move away from neutral spine under control. Okay. Now, the other thing that's important also when, you, when you're get, starting to move outside of that and you're starting to load the spine, it's not just the muscular system, but it's also the ligamentous system. So again, we know that with forward flexion, so once we get to around 45 degrees of forward flexion of the spine, these 
um, stabilization mechanism switches from muscular to ligamentous. So the thing, the thing that you need to have a strong ligamentous system apart from physical load. So obviously training in the gym will help with that. The other thing you do need is a good diet and making sure that you're eating things like, you know, good proteins, good collagen, things like that. So I definitely wouldn't um, subscribe to, and I'm sure you don't either, only ever training in, in neutral spine. But then coming back to what you were saying as well, when you start loading the spine in particular, so if you're doing heavy squats, heavy deadlifts, now it becomes a case of, okay, let's look at the risk benefit ratio here. So if you're lifting a, if you're doing a heavy squat, now you're putting a, a, a high compressive load through the spine. Now, if you want to flex the spine, you know, and obviously as you go deep into a squat, the lumbar spine generally has to flex. The question is, do you want to put such a compressive load through the spine whilst you're going into lumbar flexion? Because obviously, again, what you're doing, you're compressing the anterior disc, you're pushing the nucleus posteriorly towards towards the nerve roots. So you've got to ask yourself a question, is, is the benefit worth the risk? Now, from my, my viewpoint, especially if someone has a, a history of disc issues, or if I know they have a flat lumbar spine, because if they've got a flat lumbar spine, the chances they've got some level of disc bulge is increased, then I would generally limit their squat depth to the position where they can maintain neutral spine. And I would say a similar, similar thing for the deadlift as well, although that's a bit, bit more difficult to achieve. Yeah, I would, I would a hundred percent agree with that. That's um, like, like that's exactly, that's exactly right. I think you said that really well, that when you're doing your rehabilitation, you should be looking at it. The other thing you said is like, when we're going out of it, it's, it's the control bit that I think that people struggle with. You know, it's the, it's not even just the thing of like, oh, um, you're in or out. You know, I feel sometimes people like myself, say if you had someone who is very anti, like, look, you should be able to, you should have control through the whole range, which I do agree with. But I'm saying most people, if you're talking in a gym, are, are, are so just like beginner level, basically. They haven't got the conditioning. They haven't got the the awareness. Like with the back aware belt, like it is a belt, it gives you feedback the whole way through. So it doesn't bother me really to be in a neutral spine. It's to be aware of your back is in this position right now. Um, And as you said, then also, if you think about it, for most people, if we talked about the, the basic function of the joints, the, the, the lumbar spine, like per per rotation, say it's about four degrees. Most of the upper, most it's the upper back that needs to be rotating. So, I think it's like you were saying, Lee. It's like, you know, it's like you can't cut corners on the nutrition. Like, say if if you're getting chronic inflammation through nutrition, but just going to ignore that part and then try, say, just do the mechanic side that I'm talking about. It's like, well, look, it's going to be so much harder for you to like activate the core and the same similarly then it's like you you have to get the basics right so if you're going back to tennis and but you haven't actually physically like worked on up like thoracic rotation like upper back rotation so that that's doing the that's doing the the primary action and then the lumbar spine is basically like what i would do initially if i was going back to tennis i would do like my my core training, I would focus on the neutral spine. I would at the exact same time focus on keeping the belly button in, engaging the core, and then just focusing on can I like rotate through the upper back with minimal rotation through the lower back. Then the next thing I would work on would be like anti-rotation of the core. So I'd actually, you know, your press of payoffs, like cross chain. So bringing a weight across the body and can, in a, like a half kneeling position, can I like resist that? Now we're in a perfect position to like go back to like adding bands or because what we've done is we've trained, we've trained the core initially to be stable and have that proprioceptive awareness. We've trained the joints that need to take the majority of the mobility in. 
And we've also trained the, the, the deeper muscles to like resist excessive rotation. And now, as you said, layer on top of that, um, the rotation or the, the full movement of the spine and load it up in different positions. A lot of people conceptually understand that, but can miss that part or not do that and wonder why there's issues or wonder why. Um, and the other thing then, what we said about like loading deadlifts, I would agree as well. I would just go to a neutral spine because unless it's like a power lifter or it's a competition and then it's a different thing we could talk about. The majority of people, um, if they're going into squat or deadlift, I said, why do you want to do this? It's like, well, I want to kind of like a strong core. I want that to kind of be like toned. And I'm really, like, and what are you targeting with this exercise? I want stronger, I want stronger and more toned like glutes and legs. Okay, well, once you start then, once, when you're going down and then basically what's happening, say if you're going to butt wink, you're moving through your hips, your legs are taking the majority of the load you get to a certain limit where you can't move through that, be it awareness, be it a lack of control after that area. Well, now it's like, well, now really what you're working on is like ligamentous, um, ligamentous loading of the the spine. You've got to look, as you said, at the risk reward of that. And then is that what you want? Is that what you're doing here? Or because if it's just the, if it's get stronger legs, if it's a have the core stable as you move through the legs well you've got that and any any lower now is not going to achieve that and you would be actually better off take the weight away and then work on like deep deep squat mobility and uh in those type of areas Catherine had always been fit and active when she suffered a debilitating back injury she was barely able to get out of bed or walk without being in excruciating pain she visited her GP, who prescribed anti-inflammatories, painkillers and muscle relaxants, and also referred her to an orthopaedic consultant. Catherine was bedridden for 10 days and subsequently could only get through the day with large doses of the prescribed pills. Catherine was diagnosed with a prolapsed disc at L3-4, and she was offered anaesthetic injections or spinal surgery. She was horrified and concerned that she would have constant back problems for the rest of her life. Catherine was miserable, could hardly drive, a day at work was agony and any movements in bed were very painful. I carried out detailed postural assessments, muscle strength tests and analysis of her movement patterns. I identified the biomechanical problems and prescribed a very specific exercise program to correct her posture, reduce her level of pain and to prevent the injury reoccurring. After five weeks on the program, the pain had reduced hugely in her back and Catherine stopped taking painkillers. After 10 weeks, Catherine was back jogging and doing more intensive exercise with absolutely no back pain, and she was so pleased that she was able to pick up her young son again. If you're suffering like Catherine was and you'd like to find out more about getting to the root causes of your back pain, go to www.bodycheck.co.uk and request a consultation. Now, back to the podcast. Yeah, it's an interesting point you made about, you know, obviously the, the lumbar spine only rotates between three and 18 degrees at a functional level, whereas the thoracic spine, you know, it's got a huge range of motion. But obviously if, if someone's thoracic rotation is limited, they're going to overcompensate in the lumbar spine, you know, which again could damage discs, it could damage facet joints, et cetera. But the, other, the other thing that's quite important as well, and this is my, t- my tennis head speaking now, is that, you know, to to fully flex the arm, which obviously you need to do when you're hitting a ball overhead, you you need full extension of the thoracic spine, right? The last 40 degrees of arm flexion actually comes from thoracic extension. So if someone doesn't have full thoracic extension, what they're going to tend to do is overextend through the lumbar spine. So in, and again, from a tennis perspective, that's every time they serve. So So the thoracic spine needs to be needs to have good range of motion in rotation and extension in order to take excessive stress off the lumbar spine as well. And again, I, I don't know, you know, I, I've never studied physiotherapy or osteopathy or anything like that. I don't know if that's something that's generally taught that, you know, if someone's got lumbar pain, have do you look at the thoracic spine and make sure that's got full range of motion as well? It's It's not taught enough. And that's why when I went to Canada and they were talking about this idea, it just 
it just was like you know a lot of times it's just look at the area and get it stronger and it's isolated as you said it's even isolated mechanically let alone as you said nutritionally but that's one thing i love to do if listeners if you can like if you hunch over and try lift your arm as high as you can you'll see it only goes a certain uh, high, height if you just go up tall like imagine your head is getting uh, pulled up to the top of the wall we're ex- open up through the extension now with any change in the flexion of your arm and that's exactly it that someone could think oh you need to work on shoulder flexibility and it's like you don't you need to work on like thoracic spine upper back extension like you know going up against the wall and trying to open up the back or like um you know keeping and that's where i was saying that a lot of the issues we see knee and back why because as you said you have someone who's serving they are overly arching at their back because they do not have the range of motion. And like humans are not that evolved from cavemen or cave women. So we are designed to move. Like the most important thing was move, get food. Like don't be just, you can't, so you can't have it where you're like, oh, I'm not moving through my hips that great. I'm just going to like sit here till I work that out. It's like, no, no, you'll always be able to limp. If there's something on the ground, if I can't move through my hips, I'll just move excessively through my back. If I can't open up through my thoracic spine, I'll get the movement through somewhere else. And that's invariably what causes a lot of the issues. The other one, just to think, I was just thinking about there, um, you t- when you were saying that about the ex- thoracic extension, I thought it was such a good point about that's where you should get the rotation. The other one is the same. I don't actually mind like, because someone could say, well, I can't. I can't bend to the floor to pick something up, you know, without rounding my back. I just don't have that range of motion. What am I meant to do? And I'm like, that's fine. A lot of times, if you can think about it, it's like, where is the predominant load going? So if someone is going to pick something up, especially if they have back pain, what I would tell them to do is, one, push your hips back first. So now the hips and the glutes are going to be taking the predominant load. So I push those back as far as I can and I'm working on that range. Second thing I do is I put my hand on my thigh. Now half the load is going to go at least through my knee, my hand and my thigh and the other half is going to go through my back. So I push my hips back as far as I can. I then can bend through my knees a bit and then I'll round. And the last thing is rounding through the back to pick the thing up. That's so much different. And if it's something small, that's that's a good way of doing it because you're taking, the hips are taking what they can, the knee is doing it, and then the back is rounding. And if we were, if we were fully like, fully healthy, if we didn't get like from sitting and just modern day, that's, if you look at people when they don't have toilets or whatever, they not, that's how they naturally do. There is a slight round, but the pre- predominant movement is through the hip with a bit of help through the back. Um, a lot of people now, because they are stiff through their hips or don't have that awareness, they just fold and then all the pressure is through the back and the hips are taking none. It's, it's a thing called moment arm, but it's like if you push your hips back first, that joint is the primary, um, like absorber of the force is taking the, taking the load with the back helping. That's the way it should be. That's the way we're designed. If it's, you don't move through your hips and your knees and then your your back take the load. That's not the way we're designed. So I feel sometimes when we're talking about the neutral spine, a lot of times it's like two people who are talking about it who have so much more awareness than the normal population. Like when I go to a gym, I'm I'm coming home bleaching my eyes from what I'm seeing. I'm not seeing considered like, oh yeah, that person is doing this deadlift that way because they want to, you know, work their like a ligamentous load or or work like a controlled deadlift. I'm just seeing someone who can't push through their hips either because of a lack of awareness, a lack of mobility, a mobility or a lack of like stability or activation being the three main reasons I see poor movement. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting what what came up in me when you were speaking then, um, particularly about, you know, how do you pick things up from the floor? And, you know, I try and get across to, to my clients is that, listen, I can give you the best corrective exercise program in the world but you're probably only going to be doing it for three maybe maximum five hours a week 
but you're probably going to be sat at a chair somewhere for 60 hours a week. So let's just say best case scenario, you're doing five hours of corrective exercise against 60 plus hours of sitting in a chair. Which one do you think is going to have the biggest effect on your posture and your biomechanics? It's the way you sit, right? So, you know, the listeners obviously can't can't see me right now, but, you know, I'm standing, right? I have a standing desk because, you know, as someone that injured two lumbar discs 10 years ago, I don't want that happening again. So I absolutely minimize the amount of time I spent, I spent seated. And that's not to say you can't sit in a better way, but, you know, I have a saying, convenience kills, right? And some of, some of the most convenient things we have in our life are actually quite dangerous to us. We've already mentioned microwave ovens, right? The chair is, yeah, okay, it's a great invention, but actually it's caused quite a lot of problems biomechanically for human beings. You know, you, you say we haven't evolved very far from cavemen. I would say we've devolved from cavemen from a from a biomechanical point of view. Oh, yeah, 100%. And I think... But I think what you're saying there is so true. It's like the, these are the convenience kills is such a good line. And um, like with that caveman, it's like that's why, as you said, like even some of the foods we I'm re- re- reading the sapiens and they're like even all our wheats and oats. It's like it's not the way like the the hunter gatherers diet was like so much better um, for them than us because there's such a variety. But um, yeah, no, that's exactly it. If people are sitting, like say if you ha- can't get a standing desk, one thing I always say is like, come to the edge of the chair. So at least that you're not all the way back. Then drop, drop one knee to the ground. So essentially like you're in a hip flexor stretch and hold that like for the first bit, it will feel uncomfortable because you're, as you said, 50 hours, maybe in a chair a week, you're going to feel very tight through the front hip, but that's because the hip flexors have got so tight. But if you can hold that, say five minutes, then take that other one and drop the other leg, try stand up, try, try move. But that's a good way where I do it. Like, so I'm, if I'm sitting here, I always have like one knee to the ground. So I'm stretching my hip flexors. I'm just basically perched on the very edge of the chair. Now it's still not ideal, but it's a nice way of, um, of getting like a break from sitting, keeping the back in its normal, natural alignment. Um, Without like, if you if you can't get a standing desk, a standing desk would be ideal. Unless you have stenosis, then you might want just something something changing again. As you said, little breaks are really good. You know, for every hour you're sitting, you should be standing for at least two minutes or walking or power walking just to try reset what you're doing. And and I love that line, convenience kills, because that's people are like, oh, but that's hard. But it's like you know, life. There's a great line like, life is hard when you live it the easy way, and it's easy when you live it the hard way. Yeah, I like that saying. I mean, the other things that that I do recommend clients when they can. So apart from, you know, adjustable desks, um, another thing that can be quite useful to sit on, particularly people with back pain, if if possible, is, is a Swiss ball. So to get a Swiss ball that's kind of big, bigger than you would normally, like if you're going to use it for exercise, get the next size up, just yeah. deflate it a little bit so it's a bit easier to sit on. But obviously what that does is it actually... It's actually called active sitting. So you're creating a low level activation of your stabilizer muscles. Now, for most people, you you need to do it in short bursts because most people are what I would call fast twitch dominant. So their ability to sit on a ball for a long period of time is, is not that great. So you have to, like any exercise, you have to build it up. So you might start 10 minutes on a Swiss ball. You might have to sit on a normal chair again for 10 minutes. I keep swapping that out. And then eventually you might do 15 minutes, 20 minutes at a time, maybe an hour at a time. Obviously, some workplaces have problems with that because, you know, they think it might be a health and safety risk. But um, but that's an option. The other the other thing is something I've mentioned as well is a lumbar roll. So again, if you've got disc issues, having a lumbar roll to kind of ensure that your spine is in either neutral or, or even slightly extended position. The the other thing I do advise clients as well is to get a very good ergonomic chair as well. And they're not cheap. <laughs> to get a very good chair, you, it's a lot of money. But if someone can afford it, I would highly recommend it. And and for workplaces, I mean, I know workplaces, they uh, they don't like spending money. But actually, 
I think if they invested in very good chairs for their staff, they would probably save money in the long run because they would have less um, time lost due to back pain, which last time I looked is the most common reason for people losing time at work. Yeah, it costs a fortune. And I think I think they're all really good. I love the lumber roll. I love the Swiss ball, as you said, especially work from home. You could have it, like I can see here, have it there, switching in and out. The idea of a good chair is brilliant as well. The key thing, guys, as well, I think is like, there's no good sitting position that is good eight hours in a day. It is important that like, you know, veering up what you're doing. So like, as I said, come to the edge of the chair, dropping the knee, standing up, walking, even like just like you could do that position I was talking about to the edge, then have your lumber, lumber roll, sit right back in, have the lumber roll support that's going to take any pressure off the back. You know, you have your good chair then for the rest, but just even when we're sitting, like be moving, you know, like like maybe bring one leg up across the body, you know, so like where you kind of sit where your ankle is on your knee. Um, and drop them back. Like changing positions will just add a different, like a different stress or strain to the body, and will take pressure off other areas. And again, ones that you find comfortable or don't seem to cause irritation, do more of. But don't. Um, that's one thing I find with like ergonomics. The chairs are good because, as you said, a good chair will have a natural lumbar arch in it. It'll give you maybe like even a head. So it kind of gives you that cue for good like thoracic extension. So they're so much better. But make sure that you are moving. You are changing the type of positions you're doing because then that will allow the body to kind of stay a little bit more flexible than rigid because that's one thing with the ergonomics and like the way you said it was perfect with the Swiss ball, with the different actions. Sometimes when people are just setting chairs, they nearly want to set that there's this one ideal position that you should always be in and that is not the case yeah absolutely i just want to go back to talk a little bit more about exercise there was something i was going to bring up and i've just i've just remembered what it was the the other thing that i tend to look out for as well with back injuries particularly again lumbar disc injuries is if someone has weakness in the gluteus medius so what what you tend to see if someone's got a weak gluteus medius is that when they when someone's standing on one leg or they're stepping up with one leg is that the opposite side pelvis tends to drop downwards and what that does is that creates flexion in the lumbar spine and if obviously if someone's doing that repeatedly i mean imagine if it was a runner for instance you know if someone's doing i don't know how many steps a week hundreds of thousands maybe even in the millions Every every step they're taking is putting some kind of stress or even micro trauma through through the tissues, and so that again is another uh, area to look at for someone that's got lumbar spine issues or pain. Is and we we call that when when the hip drops down or the pelvis drops down on one side, we call that a Trendelenburg sign. Um, and again, that that's something that. I think often probably gets missed in in a lot of people's treatment or at least in, in the assessment of, of a person with lower back pain. Yeah, 100%. And then if you think about it, right, what well, that's, you'll see in runners as well, if you go into like a park or whatever, if the inside of your shin is extremely mucky at the end, so the inside of your, yeah, your shin bone, that's because one leg is actually like clipping off the other because it doesn't have that kind of lateral stability to hold. So we we get that or the knees can kind of buckle in. Um, Exactly. That can, one, it's just when the pelvis is dropping that side, it is, um, it's causing issues. The second thing it does is it comes back to what we were talking about with the piriformis because say glutes and, um, transverse abdominis the core muscles are not working and then that smaller inefficient muscle is working a lot of people especially with like pain standing or just like general backache there's a muscle in the back called the ql the quadratus lumborum which is a smaller stabilizer muscle of the in the back that muscle can go into extreme 
spasm and cause a lot of pain because it has to then compensate for the bigger glute medius muscles on the side of the pelvis not doing their job. So a lot of times it can actually have like that direct link where because those muscles go into spasm and it's like when people have that real tightness in their back, um, that can be the QL where because the glute medius isn't working. Generally, with all all things, and I think the glute medius would be a good one to look at, is when we're trying to correct something, we look at the mobility first. Can they move through the joint? The second then is stability or activation. So what we're talking about there is like the person might have good range of motion through the hip, but the, the glute medius itself isn't switched on. Okay, so... Um, the kind of work you want to do is like putting a band around your your knees, doing like a, a glute clam, so coming up and down. Um, then different variations of that. We can have like a straight leg and then lifting it up. We can then go in, uh, go in standing and like bringing out the legs, monster walks, etc. Now, that's the activation. You want to do those, you know, like six, I do pulses, like five pulses, six reps of that. Then I'll go knee up, ankle up with two bands and hold that. I'll go straight leg and do the same. That's the stability. That's number two. So with mobility, stability or activation. Number three there though, that can be often, often forgotten is motor control. I saw this, I had a guy come to me. He'd been going to a really like reputable, like surgery kind of clinic, but they do a lot of um, physio for four months. They're very big on strength, which I totally agree with. But he was doing the same rehab for four months. So this guy's like abduction strength of the glute medius was off the chain, like like ridiculously strong because he'd been doing the, uh, the bridging, like he'd been doing bridging, he'd been doing glute clam work, even monster band moving out the leg. But I, I'd go for a run with him as well. And that drop was still there because you need to practice the technique of what you're doing. So they had not done any like real like single leg stuff. So one thing I would add there is just like Lee was talking about, if I'm doing, I call a running man, if I'm standing on one leg, bringing the leg back like I'm going to run as I push up. So now I'm fully extended, my knees locked out, my knees up, I'm keeping my belly button in, my ribs down, so I'm not leaning backwards. And the the, say if the right leg is off the ground, I tell people, lift the right hip up slightly. Do not have that hip lower than the left hip, the standing hip. Lift it up slightly. Now what we're doing is we needed to activate the muscle first. If we started trying that lift the hip slightly without getting the glute activated, all that's going to happen is the QL is going to work way more. But because now the glute is work, the glute medius is working in the basic sense, it now allows allows us to practice the technique element, the motor control, to use that in functional patterns, and that's the that's the step that can be missed a little bit. Yeah, we have a saying: uh, isolate and then integrate, and that's really what you just described that's there. Exactly. It. That's <laughs> that's much more succinct than I said. <laughs> is there is there any other any other advice you'd give people in terms of exercise that have got back pain? I think I think just what we're saying that isolate and integrate, make sure that, as you said, that it's part of an overall structure that like they're looking at trying to improve movement through the hip, either with like your glute bridging or flexibility, looking at opening up the upper back, um, using something like the neutralizer on my back aware belt just to make sure you have awareness and then you can hold, you're like deliberately able to contract and like just hold the position so we're not getting accessor, accessory movement through the back when we're trying to move through the hips. That'll take a lot of pressure off. And then I think it is get to your feet and practice the functional action. So once you're doing these in basic sense, get back up, try these things. And in fairness, Lee, I'm not just saying it. It's like one thing I haven't been thinking about will be, I, I preach the holistic on the mechanic side because it's lost. But also then look, if things, if you were feeling like I'm doing a lot of mechanically right here, do look also elsewhere. Look like maybe it is like there's inflammation in your diet that you're not really you've you've just like got into a rhythm of eating something that you didn't eat, or maybe take something out of the diet um to help. And then sorry, the last thing I would say is like 
while we want to get the back stronger as one element, don't pick the scab, as Stuart McGill um, says. Look at the things that might be irritating your back. Like if you see what Lee, not sitting, slouching on the couch, the first five minutes in the morning, like making sure that you're giving yourself that mechanical advantage throughout the day. They would be the things I'd say. Cool. Cool. So um, we've covered we've covered quite a lot today. I'm sure we could probably carry on for another couple of hours. But um, but what what's next for you, Owen? Uh, yeah, we're just working on the back of Wearabell, trying to get it ready. Um, I was looking at like it's just taking a while with the app and the sensors. So continue to do that and just continue to kind of um, hopefully have that out maybe by the end of this year, start of next year. So if people want to check that out, they can go to back of Wearabell's. So B A C K A W A R E B L T dot com. You can sign up for the waiting list or you can go to backawarebelt.com slash back book and you can get a free copy of my book, Secrets of the Healthy Secrets of a Healthy Spine. Just a couple of like newspaper articles that I've done on back pain throughout the year. Years. Cool. And are you on social media? Yeah, we have a back aware belt um dot com uh like it's back where at back where belt on everything and then i'm also on at everard uh physio and pilates e v e r a r d that's the other page but yeah if at back where belt on facebook or instagram awesome awesome owen thank you so much for coming on and uh sharing your wisdom on, on back pain with me today lee i absolutely love that thank you so much i really enjoyed that episode so thanks a million Awesome, awesome. So that's all from Owen and me for this week. But don't forget, you can join me same time, same place next week on the Radical Health Rebel podcast. Thanks for tuning in. Remember to give the show a rating and a review and I'll see you next time.